Welcome to Washington Times Higher Ground. Joel, this story out of Pakistan is incredibly disturbing about a young man who is being given the death penalty over a blasphemy charge. Tell us a little bit about what led to this point. Sure. So this young man's name is Noman, and he also has a cousin named Sunni who lives in another city hundreds of miles away in Pakistan. And about four years ago, they were both arrested on the same day. And the police accused them of like exchanging WhatsApp messages that were blasphemous about Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Uh, no one has ever produced these text messages. No one has ever shown any evidence that this is true. Uh, so we don't really know why they were accused. Sunni says that he was in an argument with some Muslims about a cricket match a few days before they were arrested. Um, but other than that, they really have no idea why they were targeted like this. But someone somewhere apparently accused them of blasphemy, which in Pakistan, blasphemy against Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, is um, punishable by death. So now Noman Masi, one of the two cousins, has indeed been condemned to death by a court in Pakistan just this past week. So let's talk about blasphemy a little bit more because this is a foreign concept to people in the West, the idea that you could be brought up on charges, let alone put to death, given a death sentence over insulting, you know, somebody's, you know, profit, right? I mean, this, in America, people are insulting each other all the time over all sorts of different things, religious insults, all of that. It's just, it's part of the First Amendment. It's part of freedom of speech. So, and freedom of, of religion as well. In this particular case, and then I want to get into blasphemy more broadly, but when we when we look at this story, this is a Christian, right? So you have a Christian family here. How common is it for blasphemy charges to be brought up against Christians like this? It's fairly common. Um, so something around 1,500 people have been accused of blasphemy in Pakistan since 1987. Um, of those, 78 were murdered um, before they could be sentenced or have their sentences carried out. So what usually happens is that just the accusation itself will incite mob violence against the accusee. Of those 78 people who were murdered, over half were Christians. And Christians are like 1% of Pakistan's population. So it's wildly disproportionate uh, use against Christians specifically. There's also another group, religious group in Pakistan called the Ahmadiyya Muslims, who are a small kind of non-Orthodox sect of Islam, and they are very often targeted by these laws. You know, when you look at this particular case, there are a couple of different factors. We're talking about blasphemy. Blasphemy is something that, again, is foreign to us in the, in the West. Even with that in mind, let's say you were to follow the law and say, okay, well, there are blasphemy laws. No man's going to get put up on these charges. He's going to go through a trial. How fair are these trials? And I think I know the answer to this, but you get brought up on a trial. You mentioned there was no evidence. And I've seen the attorney in this case also saying that nobody furnished any evidence during the trial that this even happened. What is the legal system like once you're in it? Because we're used to justice in the West. It doesn't quite sound like justice is being served there. I mean, just to give you an idea of what it's like. So Noman, the man who was sentenced to death, his cousin was recently freed on bail simply because he had been held for so long without trial that his lawyers had like an unbeatable case that he has to be freed on bail. Um, but at his bail hearing, where he was finally let out of prison, the judge got mad at the prosecution. And he said, I wish there were Muslims strong enough to defend the honor of Islam here. That's the judge in the case speaking. Um, so there was another case about 10 years ago where a young Christian girl with Down syndrome was falsely accused of committing blasphemy. And she was also released. But when she was released, a helicopter had to carry her out of the jail to an undisclosed location. Otherwise, they were afraid she would be murdered. So the societal pressure on the justice system makes it impossible to have anything like a fair trial in these cases. Yeah, I mean, that that is so... That is so bizarre. And, and I think it's actually an important factor in any case when the emotion of the public is swaying justice, that's a problem. And you have this being something that, I mean, you mentioned a number of deaths over the years, something that happens routinely. How has just, I want to get into the particulars of Nomen in his life. How has his life and his family's life been impacted as a result of this? I mean, just take us through that because I think we often talk about these stories and we don't 
actually look at the, the the very direct and real impact on the families and the individuals. Yeah, it's it's excruciating for the families. You know, Noman was about 18 years old when he was arrested, so he spent 18 to 22 of his life in prison. Um, these are the years when a normal man in Pakistan is starting to build an occupation, get married, begin to build his own household, and he's missed all of that. Um, his family has suffered terribly because they have to travel a long ways to the prison to visit him and to bring him uh, supplies, and they're missing out on his income as well. Um, I know Noman's cousin, Sunni, who was also accused, his father had a stroke when he found out that his son had been arrested for blasphemy and he has never regained the use of his right arm. You know, the, the trauma of this was just so severe of realizing that kind of the ultimate nightmare has happened to your son now. You know, and, and right now we're looking at a death sentence for Noman. And I think we have to come back to that because the rest of the world is going to look at this in horror and say, what can we do? Your organization is on the front lines of dealing with this, of helping families like this and being involved in these stories in different ways, legally down to providing resources. But what can people do? How do you turn a case like this around when you're outside of Pakistan trying to make an impact within? So what CSI does is we work with uh, human rights lawyers inside Pakistan to help people who are affected by these accusations. Uh, so we're in touch with Noman Masih's family. We're supporting them financially. We're also supporting his legal team uh, financially. And, you know, there, there is some hope sometimes that um, with a, a vigorous defense, you can find some sort of relief from these sorts of, of uh, persecutions, really. Um, so, for example, another woman who was arrested just two months ago uh, she was an illiterate woman who was accused of burning pages of the Quran. So how do you defend yourself? You don't even, you can't even tell what is in the Quran and what's not. Um, but the lawyers that we support were able to get her out of jail on bail after about 20 days. Um, so we're, we're doing that. We're supporting human rights lawyers inside the country. We're also doing some external pressure, right? So we're publicly calling on Pakistan's minister of law and justice to reverse this case to have uh, Noman Masih pardoned. Um, so these are the sorts of things that we're able to do. Financial support to the families, support to the legal teams. Um, and we pray, of course. We pray for, for deliverance and for protection for our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Where can people go if they want to support CSI, if they want to get more information on this case and others? Where can they go to do that? You can go to our website in the U.S. That's www.csi-usa.org. Well, I want to thank you for your time and the work that you do. We're looking forward to having you back again sometime soon. Me too. Thank you, Billy.